Hello, everyone. You're listening to Lipstick and Leather on LU Radio, and on the phone with me right now is none other than Blackie Lawless. How's the day going today, Blackie? I'm doing terrific. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Crazy was supposed to be the first single off Babylon. Do you plan to follow the video for Babylon's Burning with a video for Crazy? Yeah, we're going to shoot it next month, uh, prior to the uh, the North American tour. So you'll have that probably, I would guesstimate, sometime six, seven weeks, something like that. Looking forward to that. Fifteen songs were recorded for Babylon. Did the leftover songs fit the theme of the album, and will they be released in the future? That's always hard to say, because there's usually a reason that you didn't include something on a record. Um, in the, I'll give you an example, like a song like Crazy. Crazy was actually the, the rhythm tracks were recorded for Dominator. But I wasn't happy with the chorus. And I felt that, you know, the song was really good, I thought. And I thought, you know, i got a big fish on the hook here. If I don't want to mess this up. You know, and we've all, all artists will tell you the same, that we've done things where we let songs go sometimes before we should have because they weren't really finished and they needed more work. And so Crazy was one of those songs. There was a couple others on this record that certainly fit that description. So I would like a little more time to really, really perfect it. I, there's one song in particular that I'm thinking of that will be on the next record that I think is certainly as good as Crazy, if not even better. So you don't want to... You don't want to blow it, effectively, is what I'm trying to say. You want to wait until it's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. With the Babylon cover being so visual, when is the release date for the vinyl? Well, the vinyl is already out in Europe, so and it looks really cool because it's a gatefold, and um, the uh, the actual disc itself is a picture disc. And it, i got to tell you, it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It, um, it is really, really special, so... Um, I don't know when those are going to be out in North America yet, but I would imagine probably sometime in probably the next six weeks. Well, I'll have to order the version from Europe. I looked everywhere online, and I didn't have any luck finding it yet. They are really, really good. Yeah, because they're already sold out. Okay. With having done a fan-requested set at UK's Hard Rock Hell and in Melbourne, Australia on the second night, any plans to do another fan-requested night? I don't know, you know, because right now with what we're doing with the film, that's that's really difficult to do because... The setup that it takes to do this show, it's it's pretty involved. They're they're you know with the road crew and everybody to coordinate all this. It's not like you you're doing just the band now, you know. It's just there's a lot of people involved to make this show the work the way it is, and it would be, quite frankly, it would be almost impossible to to even try to do something like that now. There was talk of a making of Neon Gods 1 and 2 on DVD. Any chance this will be released down the road? I don't think so. Um, you know, that that record was pretty arguous to do, you know, and, and really detailed. And to try to do something like that, I think, would be really, really ambitious, especially now. And the version of CCR's Fortunate Son that was recorded for Neon God, maybe sometime down the road that might be released also? Maybe. You know, I mean, you do stuff a lot of times, like what we did on this record with, um, you know, the old Chuck Berry song. You know, it was we really never had any intention of putting it on the record. A lot of times, you know, what we'll do when we go in the studio is, you know, people don't understand that when playing live and being in the studio is two completely different universes. You know, when you haven't been in the studio for a while, you're... You kind of want to do something that's going to ease you into it, so to speak. You know, you're kind of like putting on the training wheels and going in and, you know, getting your feet wet a little bit. And that's what we did with with the Chuck Berry track, you know, with Promised Land, was, you know, just to, to ease into it. But a lot of times you think, you know, well, this is nice, but we'll never use this. And, um, you know, the fortunate son was a similar situation. You know, it's just, you know, we were just using it just to get our feet wet to go back in the studio. Right on. With Pete Townsend thanking you for covering the real me at Radio City Music Hall, have you heard from any other bands that Watts have covered? Any of their reactions to the cover songs? Um, yeah, I remember talking to Ken Hensley about uh, you know us doing the Uriah Heap song, you know, Easy Living, and uh, but you know, I not really, you know, I haven't. 
But then again, you know, I haven't run into them either, you know, so I'm, I'm sure, you know, that somebody would have an opinion, you know, somewhere later on down the line. It's just a question, of, you know, if you have to happen to see them or not. Well, you guys always do a good job at making the song sound like your own. Well, we're we'll trying. Having played drums on Trail of Tears, What I'll Never Find, and Ecstasy Rider, will you be playing drums again in the near future on a future release? Oh, I doubt that. I mean, with with Mike Dufke in this band, I mean, the guy's a human dynamo. I mean, there's really no need for that. I mean, the guy is just, he is a pleasure to watch him play. I mean, he really is, you know, and I, I would I'd be less than honest if I didn't tell you I was a fan of his. You know, so watching him work is is really a pleasure, and he's so good, and he's so knowledgeable about studio stuff. You know, I I couldn't even begin to think about approaching those things again. The KFT KFD tour had a very visual representation of man raping religion. Did you find that the audience and the media did they get this message, or was it over a lot of people's heads? It was over their heads. You know, one of the things that you find when you do shows like that is the social critique gets lost in in the in the shuffle and you know one of the conclusions that you come to is if you want people to really listen to what you're saying you got to turn the noise down and um because the problem is is that people listen with their eyes and not their ears and so if you have something that you really want to say musically like i said you you've got to turn the visuals down and able to do that i wish it wasn't that way but it is how did Roy Z get involved in Unholy Terror performing the solos on Wasted White Boy and Who Slayed Baby Jane? Uh, quite a bit, you know, because, you know, if I'm not playing, then I'm running the machine, you know, and for people that don't know what that means is that, you know, to when you're recording, somebody's got to run the tape machine, you know, to to hit play and record and all that stuff. So when we're we're working together, especially when I'm working with a guitar player, I'm literally, you know, feet away from him, you know, maybe five feet away from him while he's doing it. And I'm, you know, being a sounding board for that guy. And I am, I'm kind of, think of me as being his roadie at that moment, you know, because, I mean, I'm really working close with him, trying to get what he wants to put on tape, you know. And I find that it's far better that I do that with them than an engineer because the communication is instantaneous that way. It's, it's a far faster process it's more creative to do it like that the guitar players enjoy it more would you work with Roy Z again down the road I love him to death I mean it's just like he is a pleasure you know I mean he's he's one working with him is he's like one of those rays of sunshine when he walks in the room you know it's just the energy that he brings to stuff is is terrific yeah I love everything he's done also with having a hand in producing every Wasp album, would you ever produce any outside bands? Well, you never say never, but you also have to understand that producing, to a large degree, is babysitting. You know, and if you're working with real professionals, then there's no babysitting involved. But when you're dealing with bands who aren't as disciplined, then that does become kind of pulling a donkey uphill that don't want to go. And that would not be for me, you know. I, you know, I would be interested in working with people that, you know, are really there because, well, you know, when you go into Fort Apache in my studio, there's a sign above the door that says, "This is a house of creativity," and what that means is that we're here to really try to do something extraordinary. And if that's not why you're here, then maybe you shouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's just kind of the the approach that I take. Can a box set be expected down the road? I don't know. You know, we've been talking about that for a while. And it seems like every time we get close to really doing it, another studio record pops up, you know. So mm-hmm. that's always the, the big question is, like, where is there time to slot in on all these things that we want to do? And the problem is, is that we've got more things that we want to do than we have time to do them in. Because even like with this tour to promote Babylon, we started three months ago. We're going to be out until Christmas of next year doing this. And when that's done, then it's going to be time to start thinking about another studio record again. Mm-hmm. So it's just, you know, it's like 
where do we find time? It would be great to hear the four different versions of the first album and the Ace Freely demo. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be? You yeah. know, but it's like, you know, where's the time? You mentioned that you may regret turning down the role of Sammy Curry in Trick or Treat, who, of course, Tony Fields got the role. Looking back many, many, many years later, do you regret turning down this role? Uh, no, and I didn't then either. Uh, that's that's probably more myth than anything else. I mean, when it was proposed to me, Penelope Spiros brought me the script, and she, for those who don't know who she is, she did uh, Decline of the Western Civilization. Yeah. She did the first Wayne's World movie. She was the director. And she brought me the script. She was going to direct it. And uh, I looked at it, and I saw potential in it, and I went back to her, and I said, I think, it, you know, the premise of it's good, you know, but it needs some serious rewriting. And she said that she agreed. And so she went back to them to try to get them to rewrite it, and they wouldn't. And so that's the reason she didn't do it either. You know, so I didn't regret doing that version of it. You know, if, uh, like I said, I thought there was potential in it, you know, if, if the ideas would have been better. But the way, the incarnation of what it ended up being, no, I don't regret that at all. Any good stories of Carlos and Chuck singing background vocals on Running Wild in the Street? Uh, oh, wow. That was a long time ago. You know, I forgot all about that. <laughs> uh, you know, when we were at Pasha, uh, you know, that was kind of a family family environment over there because Spencer Proffer was the guy, for the people that don't know, Pasha was the recording studio that we did about half of our first album and all of the Last Command, and most of uh, Inside the Electric Circus. Well, Pasha was also the place where Quiet Riot were doing their records at the time. And it was kind of like a little mom-and-pop factory going over there. There was two studios and, in the same complex, and both of them were working 24 hours a day. And uh, so, you know, when we were in there, there was always somebody else in the other room. So if you needed help for anything... You could always go next door and say, hey, uh, who's not doing something? Come over here for five minutes. I need you. You know, and it was really, it was a very, like I said, kind of a family environment over there. I have very fond memories of that. Did Circus Circus sell the song 1980s Ladies to Kiss, and was there a version recorded by Circus Circus lineup? There is a version of it recorded, but we never sold it to anybody. I mean, that, that thing ended up, from what I understand, it's on the Internet floating around now, but it was never officially sold to anyone. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Blackie. I really, well, really appreciate it. Thanks for having it. me. I appreciate it, you know. And when we get up there, you know, you guys can come by and say hi. Yes, we'll have to hit Montreal, Toronto, or Winnipeg or somewhere for sure. All right. Okay. Well, you take care now.